But I would say that one of the uh, big takeaways here is that um, oh, astronomers are puzzled. <laughs> and learning more about the high redshift universe can only be beneficial. So if we have this sort of integrated map of CO, which would be sort of tracing the fuel for star formation, or an integrated map of C2, which is a proxy for galaxy luminosity as a function of redshift, we can uh, really be looking to understand the galaxy formation evolution or the star formation history of the universe. Um, and the other thing that's kind of cool is that since this is an intensity map, when you have things like JDOST, which are seeing these really cool new high redshift observations, that's getting the tip of the icebergs. That's, start my video, that's getting these like most amazing sources. Um, but, but this would be like a blind search for galaxies. You would not just be getting the tips of the iceberg, but you'd be getting the whole iceberg and all the water in the ocean because you are totally agnostic. You're just getting every bit of intensity that exists. Um, but also beyond sort of astrophysics, uh, you can constrain things in cosmology, which is sort of my background. I'm coming in, this as a cosmologist. Um, one of the most interesting things I think is dark energy. So here on the right, I've recast the Hubble tension to be on a plot as a function of redshift. So on the left, you have these really low numbers, uh, which is your CMB constraints. And on the right, you have these much higher numbers from your late time constraints. Um, and what I think is really interesting is with something like line intensity mapping, you could put a point in the middle. Um, and this would be an independent measurement of the Hubble constant at higher redshifts. Um, and you can really constrain the expansion history. Obviously, it'd be super interesting if this uh, systematically independent measurement gave you something that agreed with the early time or late time measurements, but also be like extremely fascinating if it was some number sort of in the middle. The other thing that I think is really cool is thinking about inflation and other ways in the CMB that you can get at inflation. Um, so when we make intensity maps, we can use statistics to study the core spatial correlations in these intensity maps to say things about cosmology. Um, and these spatial correlations in the intermediate redshifts are actually primordial in nature. So they are constraining the physics of inflation if you can measure this. Now, this is all awesome, and I wish that I was the first person to come up with this idea, but I'm not. There are many, many smart people working on this right now. And the state of the art is something like this experiment time. So if you see on the left, this is an experiment with 50 diffraction grading spectrometers. And this could reach 10 to the 5 spectrometer hours. Um, now, this unit spectrometer hours is kind of a proxy for sensitivity, because to get more sensitivity, you could either add more hours or more spectrometers, like both things work. You just put more detectors on or you integrate for longer. Um, and the sort of 10 to the five number that something like time is getting at, this would be a power spectrum detection, but no serious cosmological constraints. So to get to do this serious cosmology, what you need to do is improve instantaneous sensitivity. And I'm really excited because right now, technology is sort of just coming of age that would allow us to do this in this field. And this is why I chose to get into this for my postdoc, is because I think the timing is really interesting. So right now, these sort of, oh, you can really move. Uh, these, we're getting these single um, pixel on-chip spectrometers, which are for the first time being demonstrated on the sky. Um, this is an experiment called SuperSpec, and that's taking something like time at the left, which is 700 cubic centimeters, and turning it into something that's one cubic centimeter. And that would allow you to, to pack in the number of detectors you'd need uh, to actually do cosmology. So this is the project that I came to uh, University of Chicago to start working on, um, SPT SLIM. So this is the summertime line intensity mapper. And the idea basically is to take these new technology these on-ship millimeter wave spectrometers um, and demonstrate them, uh, which shows, will prove that this has this like unique scalable technology advantage in the field. So the idea is that we're going to deploy this high density 12 pixel dual polarization focal plane, which is about 8,400 detectors. Um, and this will be operating over the regime of 120 to 180 gigahertz. So if you see right here, this is um, a plot of line temperature brightness as a function of frequency. So the sort of 120 to 180 window will be sensitive to three different CO transitions. And this will be deploying in November, 2025 to the South Pole Telescope. And this is really exciting because if we get these detectors, we put them on the sky at the South Pole Telescope, we'll be able to use that data to prove number one, that the technology exists uh, and works. And number two, you'll be starting to start these analysis techniques of how you take these 3D data cubes and turn them into science. So a little bit about the instrument. Um, it's a cryogenic experiment. On the left, you see our cryostat. Um, radiation comes in from the top, light comes in from the top, um, is emitted by these conical horns and coupled to these spectrometer filter banks um, that are sort of coplanar with the pixels where the light lands on in the middle. 
Um, and these filter banks in this sort of hexagonal closed packed array are this the characteristic of line intensity mapping. So at the bottom, you see it for one feed line going to one filter bank, you get all of these different frequencies. And if you remember from before, all these different frequencies will then turn into all these different slices of redshift. And what's exciting is that this isn't just uh, beautiful proposal figures anymore. Uh, we have like real hardware in the lab that we're doing real testing on. So on the left, you see some testing that I was doing integrating the Cryostat and ADR out at Fermilab. The top right, um, one of our first quarter wedges of our focal plane with all of these beautiful rainbow spectrometers fabricated in this plane. And on the bottom, uh, data from one of our grad students look on the feed line where you can see all of those little resonant peaks, which is showing all of these frequency channels um, on and working. And this is sort of the uh, science prediction that we expect to get for just four weeks in the summer. So the name of the game is that you're trying to measure this blue line, this total line power. And here I've seen it for the three different CO lines as a function of redshift. And what you want is you want your sensitivity to be below that blue line because that means you can measure it. So we sort of conservatively expect that we'll get a 50 to 75% observing efficiency for about four weeks. Um, so about 300 hours on time is realistic or uh, on target is realistic. And you can see that even if we only get 100 hours, we're comfortably below uh, making a detection of the CO power spectrum uh, in all of these, just in terms of raw sensitivity, which is pretty high significance from just a single four week deployment on the sky. So the question is, is how do we go from that to these orders of magnitude improvement that we need for cosmology? Um, and sort of the magic number here is this 10 to the seven spectrometer hours, because this is where it becomes competitive with galaxy surveys and the cosmology you're getting out of galaxy surveys. Um, and the limiting factor really is detector count or focal plane area. Um, if you want to get more detectors into an area of focal plane, you need to either build a bigger telescope, which is obviously extremely expensive, or figure out a way to be more clever about for like an amount of light you can get coupled in from one telescope, putting more detectors there. So right now the technology is something like this. So on the left here, you see the SPT slim focal plane, and this is all sort of coplanar. So right now the light's coming in from the sky, hitting just those pixels in the center, but you're really only getting in this much light because you don't need to hit the filter banks. It's just how it's fabricated. And what I've been working on recently is an idea where you can take it and turn the filter banks vertical instead. So you're not wasting that. And then if you have all of these oranges facing up, you can get all of the light and actually get this orders of magnitude improvement. And sort of to put numbers on that, on the left, you see like what SPT slim is at the top right now, 12 spectrometers with 120 to 180 gigahertz bandwidth. With this new technology, we could get a factor of 50 improvement for the same telescope, which is now 294 spectrometers with about 100 to 200 gigahertz bandwidth. And this is uh, basically based on these three technological advantages. The first at the top, you have these conical feed horns that Sarah Simon has been working on to couple in the light. Um, and then there's this dual polarization orthomode transducer that I've been working on to get it sort of all pointed down. So light comes in from the top here in um, yellow and then splits off into the two polarization states, just like it had before. But instead of going straight out to filter banks, I've built this waveguide structure that twists it down to take it all vertically. Um, this allows for two times more spectrometer for focal plane area because it's actually dual polarization. Uh, and you get an octave of bandwidth. So this is the band pass. So how much light is getting through as a function of frequency, which is really, really nice. And the cool thing is that we're planning on 3D printing these out of aluminum, actually. And then when you get, you have your waveguide, you need to actually get it onto the card. So we have also a grad student I've been working with is working on a waveguide to co planar waveguide transition that basically just an, does an impedance transition between a waveguide um, and on chip. And what's really sweet is that this is a real part that we 3D printed out of ceramic and then gold plated. And the tolerances are in spec to be doing this. This is about the size of my fingernail. And 3D printing has actually evolved to the point that we can print these and manufacture them in the hope of putting them onto like real cosmology telescopes to do precision cosmology with. Um, and then the great thing is this would go into the spectrometer card and all your spectrometers would be lined up and you could still fabricate them all in the nanofabrication facility in a plane like this. So in summary, this is what I'm excited about. We have this new novel technology that's gonna get these new parts of cosmic history, this on-chip spectrometer technology and this sort of vertical focal plane structure will give you this increased sensitivity. Um, and SPT SLIM will hopefully demonstrate these analysis and hardware techniques. So I'll leave you these two dates at the bottom, SPT SLIM, first light winter 2024, next generation focal plane, first test parts fabricated winter 2023. So it's a really exciting time to be getting into line intensity mapping. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica, for the really exciting talk. Any questions?
Thank you for the talk. This is Mike Wong, the Sacred Fellow. I don't do any instrumentation, so apologies for the naive question. Uh, why why do you put it at the South Pole? What is the main advantage and what are the challenges of putting this instrument there? It's really simple. Um, so it's that the atmosphere is very transmissive there. So if you look at the blue curve on this plot, that's atmospheric transmission. So basically just like, even if you just think about it, like clouds in the way make it hard to see space. It's just like you put it where there's like less clouds, really dry atmosphere. Um, and that's why we're at the South Pole because it's a great world-class millimeter wave site. Okay, and it's okay that you only see like one half of the sky? Yeah, so these are survey instruments. So we're looking at a tiny patch of the sky and reobserving it and reobserving it to beat down the noise and beat down the noise. So the fact that the sky just does this overhead is actually a huge pro because you can keep your telescope pointed at the same patch 24 hours a day. Wow, okay, got it. Thank you so much. Yeah. We might have time for a very quick question, and maybe we can start to get the next speaker, uh, Andrew, uh, lined up. I guess a wonderful talk. Um, I actually, again, I'm not an instrumentalist. I'd love to hear a little bit about like your personal story with how you figured out to turn the Pieces of the whatever it's called down. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh so it's 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 just a uh, late night in Google. This is actually a trick people have been using on gigahertz satellites for years. They've been building them in different frequency ranges and kind of designing these like there's like actually a whole turnstile structure hidden inside where you can't see. And I was like, huh, I wish we could, I wonder if we can just put that on a telescope. So I scaled to our frequency band and sketched it up in some design software and it worked. And I was like, great, let's try to see if we can make this part work. Great, let's thank the speaker again. Next up, we will have uh, Neil Moore uh, talking about chronographs for Hubble World Surgery. Uh, he's from Space Telescope Science Institute. And uh, okay. just want to confirm that yeah. uh, everything on screen is looking yeah. okay. Where's the cursor? Okay, we're sharing the screen and mute is on the cursor. Yeah, we're not muted. That's good. Okay. Yeah, take it away whenever you're ready. Yep. Uh, can everyone hear me? Perfect. Um, so, hi, I'm Yulu Poor. I uh, will be talking about uh, coronagraphs for the Habitable Worlds Observatory. Um, and I first want to take uh, some time to thank all the leads and the fellowship in general. Uh, this is my last fellowship uh, year here. I'll be ending in three months from now. Uh, and I, I'm eternally grateful for the opportunity that I had to do all this work here at Space Telescope and, and uh, here at the, with the fellowship. Uh, so Habitable World Observatory. Uh, Habitable World Observatory was endorsed by the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey, uh, which asked for a large, around six meter in, uh, inscribed diameter uh, telescope operating in the infrared optical and UV. Uh, really dedicated to the direct imaging of exoplanets. So really going for the 10 to minus 10 contrast, 10 billion times uh, contrast, uh, trying to image and both uh, image and do spectroscopy on these uh, planets. So we've been doing direct imaging for a while. Uh, here's a, an animation of, of, I think, seven years of data from uh, Jason Wang and Christian Moba uh, showing uh, four planets orbiting this star. And you see a bunch of stuff at uh, the internal circle, lots of speckles jumping up and down. And that is the stuff that we are worried about. That is the atmosphere changing. Um, and, and we want to suppress that light from the star, uh, even though it still leaks through our, our instruments. Uh, from space, of course, you don't have that. Stuff is more stable in space, so you can integrate for longer. Uh, you can uh, go much, much deeper. Here's an example simulation of, of what an actual chronograph, an actual telescope would see uh, if pointed to Earth uh, from 10 parsecs. Uh, you can really see the, the 10 to minus 10 Earth uh, dots jumping up uh, at you uh, right here. Um, and uh, that is what we want to see. We want to now get that light into a spectrograph and really get uh, spectra from it. So the spectra, uh, here's a few example spectra for different ages of uh, what Earth would look like. Uh, at different ages. And what we are really trying to see is the fingerprints of uh, uh, molecules in the atmosphere of that uh, planet. Uh, we want to see the methane, we want to see carbon dioxide. Uh, all of that is very easily visible in the uh, infrared. We also want to see the UV, and that is mainly for uh, getting proxy for oxygen, uh, mostly for ozone, uh, trying to see if there is oxygen in the atmosphere, uh, trying to find out of equilibrium in the atmosphere. I want to emphasize here as well, dark imaging is not the same for spectroscopy compared to um, 
uh, direct imaging. Uh, transit spectroscopy really looks at uh, the upper atmosphere. It really looks through the upper atmosphere and tries to find the composition of the atmosphere over there, rather than direct imaging, which looks at spectra from the surface. So all that light goes from the surface all the way through the entire atmosphere. So you get really different types of information. So even if you had a planet where you get both transit spectroscopy and direct imaging spectroscopy, there are different types of data. They both allow us to constrain the atmospheric abundances in different ways and get more data in that way. So I talked a little bit about how you can get close to the star and really, really need to get very, very close to the star. Um, yeah, I can talk about this yeah. for a while. Take it over just a second, but it'll be back. Yep. Uh, so this is a chronograph. Uh, we want to look close to the star, because we don't want to block the planet light that is there as well. So what we do is we have a series of masks and lenses to, to propagate light in between, uh, going from the uh, pupil to the pole plane, pupil plane, and then the final science camera plane. And what we try to do is successfully suppress the star light. So we start with just one center part of the star. Uh, in the next few plane, you can see that the residual star light is very outside of the pupil of uh, the, the, the telescope. So what we can do is we can put another mask there, suppress all the light again, and then go to the final focal plane where a lot of light is actually disappearing. Yeah. Um, so what we've been doing with chronographs is, of course, this is really old, right? This is 20, uh, uh, 1939. So almost 80 years old now. Uh, what we've been doing is, is trying to optimize each of those paths separately, trying to come up with new ways. And of course, that goes into a wild growth of different types of chronographs. I won't go over all of these. Um, I don't think anyone has done that uh, in recent years. Um, what you try to do is, is try to optimize each of, the, each of those masks, and that results in very, very complicated optimization structures. Uh, I talked about this two years ago, I think. Um, and this is an example of optimizing all the three planes uh, for a certain dark zone contrast where you try to stretch this as much as possible uh, during uh, the chronograph design purpose. And this results in large scale optimizations. Think millions of parameters, tens of millions of constraints, fully nonlinear. Uh, this is a really difficult problem to, to solve, and we are still not quite there yet. Um, so going back to habitable worlds, right? We want to now, now be able to get a chronograph for habitable worlds. Uh, it's not simple, so we need to get some leadership on, on how to do that. So to do that, um, NASA set up a, a few working groups, four working groups, uh, to really look at what are the options. How do we get uh, in 2030, 2040? How do we get an instrument that actually performs as well as we want it to perform? Uh, so I am part of these two uh, design. Uh, groups, uh, and in particular, uh, I'm taking a leading role in the chronograph design survey, which tries to contact the community, tries to uh, really see what chronographs are out there, what uh, performance can each of those chronographs get. So we've been doing this. Uh, we've been collecting different types of chronographs that people are working on. Uh, I've worked out a few which are not supposed to be public yet, um, but we've now collected those chronographs. We now start to develop a pipeline to actually see what the performance of those is. One graph that we will be producing with all those chronographs, and we're not quite there yet, uh, we still have until the end of the year, is one of these. So this is performance. When does the chronograph reach 10 to minus 9 contrast for a certain style of amateur? It's the proxy for, for low order tolerance, low order robustness, and in order angle, how close can that chronograph actually reach? Uh, so we have a bunch of uh, points, which are the different chronographs, and a yellow block of lines. And that yellow part is, is really limited by fundamental physics. We cannot go to the bottom right of that uh, yellow region. Uh, we really want to get above that. So um, chronographs are very much different for different apertures. Uh, larger apertures uh, up there are, are centrally obscured and segmented, like blue bar A was. Blue bar B was segmented, but not but non-obscured, so that's slightly easier. And unobscured circular apertures are still the easiest to do. So you might think, well, why are we going for a segmented or why even bother going for an unobstructed, an obstructed aperture? Well, that is because we've gotten better over the years. This was through five years ago. Uh, in, but in 2020, we came up with the concept of the phase appetized pupil Leo chronograph, uh, which is a little time for lower A, but it doesn't follow that line at all, right? It's way, way closer to the fundamental limits. Uh, so this is what I've been spending my fellowship on, uh, trying to develop that. 
So why is that so much better, right? It's still the same architecture, same pupil, focal plane, pupil, plane, focal plane architecture. However, instead of blocking just the center star, uh, center part of the star, we now block the entire left side of the star. So we have a knife edge and we block the entire left side of the star. Of course, that results in, in PSFs that don't look like you normally expect them to look. You expect the dark one to be fully 360 around the star, 60 degrees. However, now you get only one information on one side of the star. You need to do two observations to get both, or, which is the majority of what this chronograph is going to be spent on, doing uh, spectroscopy. If you're, you know where your planet is, you can just point that in the right direction and uh, you can get your, your dark zone in that way. Uh, also, this chronograph can go really close in. So here are the dark zones for both, and I'll switch them around a few times. And you can see how much closer the uh, PAPLC on the right is compared to an APLC chronograph on the left. And this is really due to that, that uh, knife edge. It allows you to push light from the right side of the star to the left side of the star, rather than to have to push it all the way outside of the dark zone itself, which is much, much more difficult to do. Of course, theory is not everything. We want to actually see how uh, the chronograph performs, how can we actually do it experimentally? And that is what uh, this, uh, the first working group is, is be, uh, doing. They're setting up a roadmap, what test needs to be done when and which chronographs are we actually gonna test uh, at which facilities? Uh, what are the requirements for each of those tests gonna be? Uh, so I've been doing tests on HiCats, trying to get uh, ahead of that curve, uh, trying to demonstrate a few things before. Uh, actually having to demonstrate it for NASA. And uh, I've been doing that on the, the high contrast imaging, uh, high contrast imager for complex aperture telescopes at um, test beds at uh, Space Telescope. So this uses segmented default mirror uh, to really get a fully segmented telescope simulated at. I'll switch over that. So we've been upgrading that over the last uh, year. Uh, we've been going from a very messy setup to a much cleaner setup. And this is not the only just cleanliness to work with. It's also a humidity control system, um, much better uh, control of humidity, much better control of the temperature, keeping everything more stable. That's the whole goal here. Also vibrations, we've been getting better at that. Uh, so before the new enclosure, we had the, the black line vibration spectrum, huge peak at 80 Hertz. Uh, and that is uh, now gone uh, pretty much due to new, new enclosure. And this was done by a team of grad students uh, undergrad students uh, working with us on the mechanical interface and trying to sort where those vibrations are actually coming from in our, our system. So this is what I showed uh, last year, uh, monochromatic performance. We've been pushing more broadband. Now uh, this is 10% broadband and this is 25% broadband. Uh, of course, the contrast degrades tiny bits, uh, but we are really now pushing uh, to the limits of this chronograph. And now we are finally limited, not by a test bed, but by the chronograph, which is what you, what you want to be uh, for, for wave testing. I mentioned wave testing. Uh, this is something that is really important for the PAPLC chronograph. In contrast to other telescope uh, chronographs, it really allows you to measure not only low orders aberrations, which are most impactful, but also the high orders, which can be used for post processing. Uh, so this is what we've been doing for a while now. This is real data from James Webb. You can see it's not only low orders, you see low orders jumping up and down, but if I let it run longer, you can see slowly some drifts start to come in at much higher the individual segments jumping around. So of course we can do the same on high cats, but we can actually sense this while doing a chronograph. Uh, so this is just a scientific method itself. This is with a chronograph uh, and, and really sensing what, it, what is actually there. So I'll leave you with uh, two animations. Uh, one is the dark zone being dug on, on high cats with the PLC chronograph. And the others sent uh, the segments actually being sent while doing that um, and trying to correct those in close to uh, on the same instrument simultaneously with the same light. Thank you so much. Any questions? Hi, um, I'm Sada Corey. I'm actually the mentoring speaker for later today, but my question is informed by my experience with um, high contrast imaging and data DST. So, with this knife edge and eliminating essentially like half of the imaging space, is especially with a big telescope like Lumar, is that going to have impacts on 
what you can observe, when you can observe in terms of like overheads and things like that. If you want to do some kind of survey, uh, you know, you need this position angle and then you need that position angle. And, and have you looked at all or thought about the complexity that's going to add to the operation side? Yeah, so that, that is indeed, indeed the concern. Uh, so the way we envision it right now is to have uh, multiple knife edges or be able to rotate them, probably multiple knife edges, and then put them at different position angles, observe with the one that is closest to you. Uh, what is for ground-based, it's much more of a problem because you want to see the meridian transfer, uh, transit. You want to see a whole arc. Um, for space-based, you have some control over the roll angle, so you can basically choose the, the knife edge that you want, the position angle that you want. Yeah. Great. I don't think we have time for more questions, unfortunately. Uh, but let's thank the speaker again. Next up is uh, Pradeep Katine uh, from Caltech, talking about high resolution uh, astrophotonic pressure graphs. Um, and we'll talk about something sort of similar to the direct dimension. Just go with the sharing between the Okay. Can everyone hear me? No. Hi. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. This one. Um, this one. Wonderful. Uh, so thanks everyone uh, for coming. And uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, our uh, leads uh, for uh, making this uh, Hubble uh, Fellowship experience very rewarding. Uh, I'm in my third year now, so this is my last year as a Hubble Fellow. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the quest for high resolution with astrophotonic spectrographs. Um, so uh, just to motivate some of the science cases, uh, one of the most exciting um, uh, discoveries over the last decade have been the like, discoveries of thousands of exoplanets. And now we are slowly moving from an era of detection of exoplanets to an era of characterization of exoplanets. And one of the things that uh, we really need to characterize is the, or measure, is the mass of the exoplanets. Uh, so uh, just to uh, give you an idea, to measure the mass of an Earth-like planet, uh, going around some like star, uh, we will have to measure the wobble in the stellar motion uh, of the order of uh, 10 centimeter per second over a year. And that would require us uh, to have spectrographs with resolving powers uh, of the order of 100,000 uh, and uh, the Doppler stability of the order of uh, 10 centimeter per second. So um, the zoom sure. is on the presenter. Uh, zoom the senior presenter notes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Astronomer <laughs> <laughs> How does this look? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry for that. All right. So, um, yeah. So anyway, so in order to measure the uh, the wobble of the star up to like 10 centimeter per second, uh, we need spectrographs with resolving power of the order of 100,000, and then we need the Doppler stability of the spectra uh, of the spectrograph of the order of uh, 10 centimeter per second over a span over the span of a year. And in order to do uh, things like that, we will really require uh, extremely large telescopes for ground and also large telescopes in space. Uh, however, there is a catch. Uh, as the size of the telescopes grow, uh, the size of the spectrograph that go on these telescopes grow as the square of the diameter or even the cube of the diameter. Uh, and that poses a, a real challenge for the stability of the spectrograph. So here is, for example, a spectrograph on a four meter class telescope. Uh, and there is a person standing there for scale, and uh, you can see that it's roughly the size of a small car. Uh, now imagine that for uh, an extremely large telescope, like a 30-meter class telescope, that's going to be like half the size of this auditorium. Um, 
Now, with with sizes that big, uh, it really becomes very difficult to maintain the thermal and mechanical stability of the spectrograph, which is really, really important to measure uh, wobbles of the order of 10 centimeter per second. And also makes it very difficult to maintain a steady PSF, which is really, again, uh, important for high resolution spectroscopy. And so just to drive that point home, uh, here is a chart showing uh, the radial velocity uh, drift uh, as a function of temperature and pressure. Uh, so temperature on x-axis, pressure on y-axis. Uh, and uh, if we even if we maintain constant pressure and just change the temperature by half a degree Celsius, uh, that corresponds to a radial velocity error of the order of uh, 200, uh, 200 meters per second. Uh, so in order to get uh, stability of the order of 20 centimeters per second, we would require half a millikelvin level stability. So now imagine half a millikelvin level stability over half of the size of this auditorium. Uh, so that's the kind of challenge that we are dealing with. Um, so that's where astrophotonics comes into picture. Uh, so what is astrophotonics? Astrophotonics is basically photonics applied for astronomy. Uh, what is photonics? Uh, so photonics is basically the uh, the idea of guiding uh, the light using fibers and waveguides in optical circuits, just like electronic circuits. Um, so uh, the basic principle at operation here is total internal reflection that is shown on the left. Uh, but in photonics, the waveguides don't look like uh, don't look like uh, the ones on the left, but they look more like the ones on the right, where the size of the waveguide is very similar to the size of the wavelength that it is guiding. Uh, so here you can see like uh, one of these waveguides carries uh, near infrared light, and it has a size of the order of half a micron. Uh, and uh, the great thing about these waveguides is that uh, they really allow us to uh, very precisely control the interaction of, uh, of the light with like lenses and gratings. And it allows us to really uh, collapse the bulk optics, uh, the, the, the 3D bulk optics like uh, lenses and prisms uh, and um, allows us to basically collapse it down onto a two-dimensional chip. And with that uh, kind of a, a two-dimensional uh, routing of light, we get, we we basically uh, get immense flexibility in terms of how uh, we want to control the propagation of light. Uh, so with, with these photonic chips, as the size of the telescopes grow, uh, the size of the chip actually remains the same, and you can use the same chip for various telescopes. Uh, so the key advantages here are that these photonic chips are extremely compact, there are no moving parts, uh, and they are, thereby they are uh, extremely uh, easy to stabilize. And in, in addition to the compactness, they also give us uh, additional capabilities thanks to the controlled propagation of light. So uh, we can get uh, uh, spatial filtering by doing interferometry of multiple uh, telescopes, uh, spectral filtering, and also polarization filtering. So this is one of the chips uh, that we built at Caltech. And you can see that it's right next to a one cent coin. So it's really tiny. Uh, and that compactness really helps in the stability. Uh, so why should we build uh, astrophotonic spectrographs? So, so for ground-based telescopes, is uh, the stability and the advanced processing of light. Uh, and for space-based telescopes, such as SWO, it is the advanced processing of light, but most importantly, it is for the compactness uh, uh, for anything that we send in space. So here is just a schematic of how a photonic spectrograph uh, kind of fits in to a normal telescope. So we have starlight going through uh, uh, the uh, Earth's atmosphere, uh, being partly collect uh, corrected by uh, the adaptive optics. Uh, and then that gets focused into a photonic lantern. Um, so, and then the photonic lantern basically converts this light into uh, like single mode fibers that we need for our uh, photonic chips. And then that goes into the photonic chip, which is where the spectroscopy happens. So I'll just very briefly mention uh, what the photonic lantern does. Uh, so if we didn't have any atmosphere on Earth, uh, the first thing that will happen is uh, we will not survive. Um, but the second thing, um, but the second thing that will happen is uh, we'll get a very nice, well-behaved point spread function like this. And this is what we um, we want in astronomy. However, uh, there is atmosphere on Earth. Thank, uh, thank goodness, so we survive. Uh, but we then get a very distorted point spread function like the one on the left. Uh, so what a photonic lantern does is basically it converts this multimoded, uh, uh, multimoded uh, disturbed wavefront into this multiple uh, single moded uh, diffraction limited wave or like diffraction limited PSFs. Uh, and so once we have the light into these single moded fibers, diffraction limited, uh, we can then uh, pass the light on to our photonic chip. So this is how our uh, photonic chip, photonic spectrograph works like the architecture is called arrayed waveguide gratings. Uh, so basically it works very similar to a normal diffraction grating. Uh, so the light passes through the input fiber, it's, uh, it's illuminated on the array of waveguides, and that's where the path differences are created, like in a normal diffraction rating. 
And then once we have this phase array, uh, we get constructive interference of different wavelengths at different locations. Uh, and that's what we call as the spectrum. And we can then image the spectrum onto a detector or we can sample it and do more processing with it. Uh, so uh, this is a generation one device that we built in 2021 at Caltech. Uh, this has a resolving power of 12,000. Uh, it has a free spectral range of around uh, 2.8 nanometer. Uh, so 2.8 nanometer is not a very big free spectral range, but it's good enough for a generation one device. Um, so all these black lines that you see on the on the right hand side, so these black lines are made out of uh, this uh, uh, cross section uh, where silicon the nitride is the core and silicon dioxide is the cladding, and they are like 800 nanometers by 800 nanometers, really tiny. Um, so this uh, the size of this AWG is extremely small, so like just two millimeters by seven millimeters, so really really uh, tiny. Uh, so just some experimental results with this AWG, we measured uh, resolving power of 12,000 uh, at 15, 50 nanometers. So basically each of these tiny uh, blips that you see there are basically spectral channels uh, and the free spectral range is 2.8 nanometer. Um, so the end-to-end -end efficiency of this spectrograph was 11%, uh, which is okay, not very good, uh, but we have identified ways to um, expand that to all the way up to 40%. And I'll go through that uh, quickly. Um, so in generation two devices, uh, uh, generation two device, we went on to push the resolving power from 12,000 earlier to now 26,000. Uh, and also the free spectral range, we basically multiplied that by a factor of five uh, in this generation device. So now we have a spe free spectral range of 15 nanometer. Uh, so that's now getting very competitive with uh, the conventional uh, spectrographs that we have in astronomy. Uh, and this spectrograph also works over a broadband, so 1200 nanometers to 1700 nanometers. That's basically J and H bands uh, in astronomy. And the size of this spectrograph is still very small, so like two centimeter by two centimeter. And this is how it looks like in real life. So I have some of the chips here, and I'm going to pass them around uh, just so that like you can get an idea of like how small they are, and um, you can carry them around in hand or send them to space. Um, so uh, the uh, this is an experimental result of this uh, spectrograph. So each of these bumps, again, is a spectral channel, and the channel spacing is around 0 0.05 nanometer, which corresponds to a resolving power of 26,000. And the good thing is, uh, in this particular architecture, we, uh, we optimize the waveguide geometry to now get an end-to-end -end efficiency of 20%. So basically, multiply the efficiency by a factor of two. Um, I'll skip this part, but I'll go on to the generation three device. Uh, which is uh, which is basically made out of doped silica. So we basically uh, just uh, completely got rid of the silicon nitride material. We completely changed the material to now uh, using doped silica material, which is closer to the material that is used in fibers. And uh, the 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 advantage there is that the fiber to chip efficiency increases dramatically by just changing this material. Uh, so with with this generation three uh, spectrograph, we uh, achieved a resolving power of uh, thirty thousand with a free spectral range of thirteen nanometers. So quite comparable to conventional spectrographs. Uh, and here is uh, here are the results. Uh, so these are these are like the latest, very freshest results uh, from uh, our lab. Uh, and so again, like the channel spacing here is zero point zero four nanometer, which corresponds to a resolving power of thirty thousand. And the great thing is that now from earlier 20% uh, efficiency, we have now pushed the efficiency all the way up to 40%. So we have gone from 10% to 20% to 40%. So over the last years, over the last two years, uh, we went from generation one device to generation two with like higher resolution and higher efficiency to now uh, something that is that we that is now getting really competitive with uh, conventional uh, spectrographs. So what's coming up next? Uh, so I want to explain this concept with, uh, uh, with the prop of a stick. So let's say you have a stick and you have a scale which has a least least count of one centimeter, uh, but the scale is of course like has some non-integer length. Uh, now, if I give you another ruler with an offset of one third centimeter and give you another ruler of, with another offset of one third centimeter, then you can actually measure the length of that stick with a precision of one third centimeter, even though each of those rulers has a least count of only one centimeter. And we basically applied the same concept uh, for AWG. So in AWG, the uh, a unique uh, property is that uh, as you change, as you slightly change the input offset uh, of the of the waveguide, uh, we get 
an offset, a precise offset in uh, the spectral dimension. So basically, a spatial dimension offset is equivalent to a spectral dimension uh, offset in the output side. So we basically we can get three different uh, offset inputs, and we'll get three different uh, spatial sampling, uh, th three different spectral samplings uh, on the output side, and we can use that to get higher spectral uh, uh, resolution without actually building a higher spectral resolution uh, spectrograph. Uh, so we did that in lab. We achieved that in lab. Uh, so with uh, this is a uh, this is basically like an infinite uh, uh, resolution uh, spectrum uh, that's a reference spectrum and this is how the spectrum would look like if we had sampled it with an R of eighty thousand uh, spectrograph and uh, now with our uh, this drizzled AWG concept basically drizzling the uh, the inputs uh, we are able to reconstruct the spectrograph to a uh, resolution of 80,000, but with a spectrograph that has a native resolution of only 26,000. So basically a factor of three improvement uh, without actually changing anything about the spectrograph. And we don't even have to do any of the switching ourselves. It's all done electronically. Um, so I, the, the next future direction uh, that we are, that I'm currently working on is to uh, to make this spectrograph very stable in temperature. So we've already achieved uh, temperature stability of the order of 10 millikelvins, and that's with a setup which literally costs less than $100. Um, and now the next step is to uh, to push this uh, spectral stability to 1 millikelvin and then take it on to Palomar Telescope for on-sky testing uh, with uh, laser frequency combs for uh, excellent uh, spectral calibrations. Uh, so uh, just to summarize, uh, we have the you know the current uh, spectrograph with forty thousand resolution. Uh, we want to push uh, uh, the the precision by using stable temperature uh, control, uh, and we want to do uh, a uh, on sky demonstration on Palomar later this year, uh, all towards the goal of uh, building a spectral um, uh, uh, all towards building a spectral spectrograph with resolution of greater than hundred thousand. Uh, so just before uh, before going away, I will talk about astrophotonics roadmap, which is a leadership effort that I was involved in. Uh, so Nem Jovanovic at Caltech and myself were, inv uh, were invited to uh, lead this uh, very massive article called astrophotonics roadmap. It basically it's the most uh, uh, comprehensive article on astrophotonics so far. It covers it basically it involves 80 uh, experts from around the world. So basically pretty much everyone working on astrophotonics. Uh, with 25 chapters covering all aspects of astrophotonics, going from injecting light into the telescope, uh, injecting light from the telescope into the fibers, to uh, doing uh, spectral uh, spectral filtering or uh, spectroscopy, uh, to doing spectral calibration, and also uh, interferometry using photonics. So that's something that Emil works on uh, as well. Uh, so uh, please uh, feel free to Google astrophotonics roadmap. It's already online. And uh, you know, like it's you can you can find this uh, study on uh, journal of photonics, uh, journal of physics photonics. Um, so I'll wrap up here, and thank you so much. We're running pretty short on time. Maybe there's a little mic quick question. What limits the what limits the free spectral range of these devices? Yeah, so the free spectral range is a design parameter. And basically, as you increase the uh, free spectral range, the size of the spectrograph increases. And that leads to phase errors because of the fabrication issues. Uh, so uh, there, is, uh, there is constant improvement in the fabrication process, which allows us to increase the free spectral range. Uh, but we can also uh, make uh, design uh, optimizations to sort of get rid of the uh, overcome the phase error uh, challenges without actually improving the fabrication process. So yeah, thank you. Great extent, great extent of the speaker again. Now, last but not least, we have Carlos Blanco. I can see you on Zoom. Great. Carlos, do you want to test out your sound? Yeah, can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Uh, um, yeah, feel free then to try and share your screen. Sounds good. Uh, give me one second and tell me if you see it now. How was that? Uh, sorry, you muted the, the symposium mic. Okay, can you hear us now? Yes. Okay, awesome. So the last uh, talk of this session, 
is uh, from Carlos Blanco at uh, Princeton, who is going to be talking about uh, sub GEE uh, dark matter detection um, directions. So take it away, Carlos. Great, thanks so much. Okay, so um, I guess this uh, this talk is the last update in a saga that's been about four years in the making. And, uh, and, and the name of the game here is to try to detect uh, ever lighter dark matter candidates with ever weaker couplings. Um, so here we have the total range of what masses dark matter can have. And I'm sure you guys have all seen this uh, plot several times, but I'm showing it here to really drive home a, a point of distinction between the canonical WIMP window that sits above one GeV and the sub GeV space. Um, in particular, I really want to make the distinction that when you're working in the canonical WIMP window, you're really looking for rare but very energetic tracks and cryogenic detectors. Whereas in the sub GEV space, you're looking for much more feeble recoils that are more numerous, of course, but they, they really push you uh, to try to detect single quanta transitions. Um, diagrammatically, what that looks like is, uh, is as follows. So here we have a a cartoon of what these exclusion curves often look like in papers. And uh, you want to push these further down in cross section and further to the left in mass. And uh, really what that boils down to is having a smaller threshold energy for whatever uh, detecting unit you have, uh, a larger signal efficiency for your detector and as low a background as you can possibly get. Um, this sort of allows us to continue moving towards some benchmark of, of something like a scalar freeze out or, uh, you know, a dark photon freeze in model. Um, okay, so let me then start with the, the easiest possible example, which is uh, in a situation where the dark matter talks to the electrons. Here, we're just going to set up a, uh, a system that is an initial state psi i. It's going to then be promoted to a uh, an excited state while absorbing momentum Q. And when it de-excites, it's going to emit a photon. I will just tell you that a small unit that de-excites this way, it's called a chromophore. And uh, the, the kinds of targets that we're talking about when we say, you know, chromophores that can be excited through electron recoil, we mean electrons and crystals or electrons and molecules and atoms. Um, and so if you... If you think about it uh, for a little bit, you you realize that really what you're describing is a fluorescence experiment where the pump is dark matter, okay? And a cartoon of what that might look like is here on the right, where you have a, a detector volume, something like a one liter volume that could fit on a bench top. The dark matter is going to come in and it's going to excite one of these uh, hexagons, which are the chromophores. And when those de-excite, they're going to emit a photon. Now the photon has Two, two choices. It can either free stream and make it to the surface of your detector to be picked up by a photo, uh, photo detector, or it can be reabsorbed quite rapidly by, by a neighbor. Uh, the probability of this reabsorption is, is kind of your enemy, but here nature has been very kind to us because uh, for something like a solid molecular crystal, the uh, probability of reabsorption is given by the overlap between the absorption and emission spectra. And those are naturally offset from one another by a Stokes shift. And so we can kind of show that for any characteristic solid molecular crystal, we have a probability of free streaming of like 65%. Okay, so um, about four years ago, uh, my colleague Juan Coyar at the University of Chicago knocked on my door and said, look, I have this, uh, this molecular scintillator, um, Elgin 301, which is paraxylene. I want to try to detect dark matter. And so uh, some theory colleagues and I sat down and we wrote down the formalism for how dark matter can, can excite these molecules. And uh, we said, okay, Juan, we think we can do this. Um, in, in very short order, he went out and, and built this thing. So here on the, on the far left, what you have is a paint can size volume of this paraxylene scintillator. And on top is a wide area uh, photomultiplier tube. We put that in some, some shielding and we tape data. And in very short order from, you know, in six months from theory, we now have results. This is the way science was supposed to be done. It's great, hardly ever see this anymore. 
Um, and so what you're looking at here is uh, two possible choices of dark matter models. So here on the left, we have something like a contact interaction. And on the right, you have a long range interaction. Um, the data that we took uh, in, in those six months is in the uh, dotted black lines. And you'll notice that this is limited by, uh, by a rate. And that rate is a dark rate of the PMT, okay? Uh, right off the bat, we see that we're pretty competitive with, with what at the time was, uh, was a pretty bleeding edge experiment of, of Edelweiss. Um, but we noticed that the, the actual PMT was uh, calibrated in a deep underground uh, experiment to go toward noise much lower than what we saw. And so we think, well, if we put this in Fermilab at, you know, in one of their deep mines, we can go all the way down to the, to the black line. Um, that's really not the point that we got from this experiment. The point that we got from this experiment is that fluorescence with dark matter works. It's a very cheap, very efficient way of probing dark matter parameter space. I mean, this was essentially, you know, three postdocs, a graduate student, and a leader of glorified lighter fluid. So where we where do we go from here? We need lower background. And so here we have two options. The first of which is to reduce background, the absorption step. Okay. Um, and so one way we can do that is uh, by going to crystal scintillators, okay? A uh, crystal scintillator is now, instead of having a liquid, you have all of these molecules that uh, point in the same direction. And we chose for this uh, transstilbene because it uh, not only is very abundant, but it's also very well characterized. Um, and, and it can be cast into these very large optical quality crystals. And so the, the idea here is that if you orient your molecule in such a way that it points towards the dark matter wind, which is, of course, generated by the motion of the planet around the galactic center, um, as the day goes by and the Earth turns in that dark matter wind, the dark matter wind traces out something like a 90 degree uh, cone in your laboratory. And so if this molecule can tell the difference between the ceiling and the walls, uh, the probability of exciting that molecule will change throughout the day. And in fact, that's what we calculated and, and what we predict. So <clears throat> again, here we have a, a contact interaction on the left and a long range interaction on the right. Um, and these are the, the normalized rates as a function of time throughout the day for an experiment sitting somewhere, uh, you know, in Chicago. And uh, we, we found something quite interesting. One, these predicted rates can change by up to 70% throughout the day. That's a totally verifiable signal. And uh, two, we realized that something interesting was happening as we increased the possible dark matter masses. What we found is that this daily modulation never quite went away. And uh, to, our, to our knowledge, at that time, this was the first kind of detector technology that uh, that had this behavior, and uh, we discovered that this is because of a fundamental anisotropy in the momentum space form factor of these molecules, uh, as opposed to being, you know, some kind of uh, threshold effect that would be washed out if the particle were heavy enough. Um, so what does this buy you? Well, um, here in the, uh, in the black dotted lines near the top of the sensitivity plots, you have what your possible exclusion could be for something like a one kilogram uh, exposure, a one kilogram year exposure of transstilbene if you were not looking for modulation. Now, if you do look for this modulation and you can, uh, and you can predict what that looks like, uh, you buy yourself two orders of magnitude in sensitivity plus a discovery potential because now you can veto other waveforms that, that aren't exactly what, what you expect. Um, this was quite exciting because that means that, you know, with a kilogram of, of transstilbene, you can start probing uh, these benchmark lines that were sort of outside the reach of, of even the most bleeding edge experiments. So we, we got quite excited over that. Um, so how do we do better still? Well, we can go after the, the case of nuclear recoil um, by looking for a channel called the Migdal effect. So the Migdal effect is... is this situation where if I have an atom and I strike a nucleus, the nucleus recoils very quickly. And from the point of view of the electrons, now you have a, a time varying potential, and that gives you a non-trivial probability of, of ionizing. Um, this effect had been used for, uh, for looking for lighter and lighter dark matters because it's inelastic by uh, the xenon collaboration and the liquid argon community. And so one thing that 
that we asked ourselves is, does this kind of effect exist in molecules? And uh, we discovered that, yes, it does. Not only does it exist in molecules, but there's actually two uh, distinct Migdal effects in molecules. One, which is the center of mass effect, morally equivalent to, to the atomic case. And one, uh, the non-adiabatic coupling effect, which is caused by effects beyond Born-Oppenheimer, where uh, the relative motion of the of the nuclei causes this uh, this internal excitation. Um, and we were also able to derive that this non-adiabatic effect would always dominate over the center of motion uh, Migdal effect. And so we we pick these two very simple molecules, carbon monoxide and nitrogen, to to show this. Um, so here in the solid lines, uh, the, the yellow and purple lines, we show that, yes, indeed, the NAC effect dominates over the whole uh, range of masses. And interestingly, even for these two molecules, which are totally unoptimized, definitely what you wouldn't, you wouldn't use this in a detector, we're already like less than a factor of two from, from the silicon uh, people that are, have optimized these detectors quite a bit. And so uh, the open question right now is, well, one, can you optimize the, your choice of molecules? And two, does silicon have a non-adiabatic effect? Because if it does, then we expect that this red line is actually uh, further down than, than the silicon community expects by more than an order of magnitude. Um, what's more is that the Migdal effect of molecules is, uh, is directional. And so throughout the day, you get this daily modulation that's very large. And on top of that, we found that the phase of the modulation is uh, is mass dependent. So you can tell the difference between a heavy particle with a uh, with a weak coupling or a light particle with a strong coupling. And that, that was quite important. Uh, okay, so now option two is to reduce background in the emission step. In other words, to find uh, to find a target where the emission can't be faked by a thermal background. Um, and so we we noticed very quickly that there's these very exotic uh, chromophores, at least at the dark matter community, called quantum dots. And what's a quantum dot? Well, you imagine an infinite crystal, uh, the, the electrons in that infinite crystal live in these block states that look like plane waves with, uh, with very small scale uh, perturbations. Uh, if you then imagine, you know, bringing the, the infinite crystal down and, and its boundaries to the point where the electron wavelength can now start to feel the boundaries, then that block state is no longer a plane wave and it acts more like a bound state. Energetically, this means that you can, uh, that means, that, oh, sorry, uh, whereas before you had uh, continuous valence and conduction states, now you have very discrete states of the bound edge. And ultimately that leads to a very interesting signal where an initial excitation due to dark matter can generate multiple excitons at the band edge. And that leads to a back-to-back -back coincident photon emission. So here the, the idea would be very similar where you have a one liter volume, two PMTs, you're looking for double bangs. And, uh, and we found that no uh, no thermal background can can really fake this. And so very quickly, this was picked up by some folks at the uh, at Stockholm University. Here's a CAD drawing of what the detector is going to look like. We're gonna uh, put this out in, in two phases. So we're very excited about this. Um, I think I've reached the end of my time. Uh, so I'll just say that, you know, this is a, a collaboration that, that everybody should look out for. We're, we're very excited to bring this to, to the experimental community. Awesome, thanks. Uh, Carlos, for the talk. Thanks. Okay. Any um, questions for Carlos? Thank you, Carlos. Um, in your pre model, you concerned of absorption and free streaming here. How would scattering affect the picture? Well, um, the the elastic scattering cross section for photons off of molecules is tiny compared to the absorption cross section, so we don't expect that to be very significant at all. Great, I think we are uh, up on time, so let's thank uh, Carlos and all the speakers once again. Great, thanks. <laughs>